This is the last part of the course. The study of infinite series focused on specifically what's called the Taylor series, and we looked at this in the first semester, so this will be, today's lesson will be a recap of that. This is all stuff you saw in the first semester, but I will, because you've seen it once before, I'll make it a little more sophisticated and draw attention to some pitfalls or mistakes that beginning students often make. This is why we would use a Taylor series. At the stage you're at, this is the way you want to think of it. Let's say you want to find the square root of 16.4. Well, first you would reach to a calculator, but I'd like you to know what goes on inside the calculator. That's the per one of the purposes of learning Taylor series is so you know how the calculator works and how it's finding these things that would be more difficult to find by hand. So this is our example. Let's say you want the square root of 16.4. So that means the function you're looking at is the square root of x with x equals 16.4. The way that's done is we use an infinite Taylor series. That's what these are called, Taylor series, and they have a specific formula, which you saw in the first semester. You have to be given a function. You have to either be given a specific number value, c, or you have to figure it out yourself. That's a constant number, not a variable. And what makes that number special is that the function is easy to evaluate at that number, and all its derivatives are easy to evaluate. So f of c, f prime of c, f double prime of c, and so forth are easy to evaluate, are easy to calculate at the value x equals c. All right, here's the formula, and I've color coded it, and we'll discuss the color code on the next page. And the color code is aimed at uh, helping you avoid a common mistake that students make. The only variable in this, when you're finished, it looks like a lot of letters. You see the letter f, the letter c, and the letter x. And it looks like a lot of letters, but when you're finished, when you've got your final Taylor series that you can use to calculate something like the square root of 16.4, there will be only one variable, and that's the one in red. That's x. Everything else is numbers, but it feels like they're variables because you see all of these letters, and because as you find these things, you perform operations on functions which do have the letter x in them. But the last stage of those operations is to plug in a specific value, the value of c, and get a number. So this is color-coded. What's in black ink, and I know it's hard to see the difference between blue and black, but I, if I can, then you can uh, in the video. What's in black ink are numbers that are very simple. They're just obviously numbers you plug them in. What's in blue ink are numbers, but they're numbers you have to reach by doing a calculation, and usually that involves uh, derivatives. And finally, what's in red ink is the only variable that will be in your final uh, form of the series. So here's that color code. Black are constant numbers. Blue are constant, sorry, not spelled right, constant numbers that you have to calculate using the function itself and its derivatives. So blue are constant too. I tried to pick the darker colors, black and blue, for things that are ultimately numbers when you have your final form of the series. And red is the only variable. And notice how sparse that is. x, 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 and x. That's it. Everything else will be numbers. They just don't feel like numbers at first because you have to perform calculations to get them. But you don't forget to plug in and get a final number. So this, in the final version of the series, will be has to be a number. And if you have any letters in here, you've done something wrong. If the only letter in your final form of the series should be what's in red here, the x. If you see any x's anywhere else, you've done something wrong, you gotta go back and check your understanding. All right, so here's the full formula written out, more in this than this familiar form from the first semester. This is the n equals zero term. This is the n equal one term, and so forth, the n equal two term. And you can see once you've set up the index that way, look at the pattern that occurs. First derivative, second derivative, third derivative. Divide by 1 factorial, divide by 2 factorial, divide by 3 factorial. Raise it to the 1, raise it to the 2, raise it to the 3. So it's, a, it's actually pretty easy to remember this series, and here it is in n notation. The nth derivative divided by n factorial times x minus c to the n. Now if we're going to use that notation, we have to agree on certain things. We have to agree that f to the 0, the 0th derivative just means the function itself, and then that term becomes accurate. C is called the center of the series. That's the name. So we'll say that a series uh, centered about x equals c. That's the way you express it. When you see the term Maclaurin series, that's named after a different person who worked especially with series where c equals 0. So a Maclaurin series 
is a series exactly like this. It's just a Taylor series, exactly the same formula, but it has c equals zero, which simplifies a lot of things, right? This goes, this c goes away because it's zero. And the derivative is often easier to calculate when x equals zero. So Maclaurin series is centered about x equals zero. And the quick way you say centered about x equals zero is to say c equals zero. C stands for center. Right? There's one more little definition, but I think you already know it, and that's that zero factorial has to be defined to be one. Then this formula makes sense because the first term here, the zeroth term, would have zero factorial, and this formula only works if zero factorial is defined to be one. Okay, we'll do an example. And this involves a lot of writing, so it's perfectly okay to, to uh, first you should try it on your own. You should pause the video and try all of this on your own. But then as I do it, you may want to speed up the video to get through the steps. Okay, here's our original problem. Approximate 16.4 using a three-term Taylor series. So this is the original problem, and then this is what would be added, telling you how many terms you have to write. Now, if you calculate a term and it turns out to be zero, which is very common uh, with certain series, for instance, the Maclaurin series of sine of x or, or of cosine of x, that doesn't count as one of the terms. This three term, when you see three term Taylor series, that means three non-zero terms. It won't say non-zero terms, so you have to know that's what it means, three non-zero terms. Okay, so write what the function would be, f of x, and then write what the c would be. Okay? And I'm not color coding this page, just because I want to have to write a lot of stuff on it. So the function here will be the square root of x. Since we have to take derivatives, we want to keep in mind that means x to the 1 half. That's the function that you can see from that. And then you find the value nearest to 16.4, where it's easy to take the square root and easy to find the subsequent derivatives. And obviously, that's 16. All right, so let's go through and do this first step. What does that mean? That means you write the function um, here. That's the nth the f to the 0, then f1, this means the first derivative, and that would mean the second derivative. And notice that's an x, so we're going to write them out with x's. Now, however you come up with your final Taylor series is fine. I'm going to show you what I think is the most organized method. All right, so the function itself is the square root of x, which could be written x to the 1 half to make it easier to do derivatives. Now make it easier to find this. This is f1 of x, which means the first derivative of x, which would be 1 half x to the negative one-half, and I write it that way to make it easier to do the second derivative that would come next, negative one-fourth, right, x to the negative three-halves. All right, the next step, I think now we've got our, our uh, function, first derivative, second derivative in function form, the next step would be this. If you look at the what's on the previous page, you'll see that ultimately we want to get to f to the n, it's not two, that's not raised then, that's the nth derivative, the nth derivative of f with c plugged in divided by n factorial times x minus c to the n. That's eventually what we want to get to. And you could try doing that all in one step. I'm just writing in a way that's organized. I know I need to get that, so I'm doing it piece by piece, and it becomes clear when we're all done. So now we're going to plug in c. Well, what's c? 16. So 16 to the 1 half is 4. Then we plug in 16 here. And if it helps, you can write this as 1 over 2 times the square root of x to help you do the calculation. So this is 1 eighth. And if we plug in x equals 16 here, we get negative 1 over 256. Okay. I think I'll draw a line there to make it a little clearer. Comes next. All right. Remember what the entire term has to be. It's f nth derivative with c plugged in over n factorial times x minus c to the n. All right, so let's write out what that would be. 4, okay, 1 eighth, right, from above, divided by 1 times x minus 16 to the 1, all right, and then negative 1 two f over 256 from above, divided by 2 factorial times x minus, oops, sorry, times x minus 16 to the 2. And this is really our series. It's just you'd lose one point writing it this way because it's not simplified. And remember, we can do this now to make it clear what this is. 
It has plus signs between it. And of course, you can also simplify plus a minus into just a minus sign. So that's how we arrive at our series. That's how I do it. I think that's the most organized way, maybe to make it clearer. Draw a little dividing line right there. I know I need to find, write out the function itself. That's easy. That's, I know that from the beginning. And start writing its derivatives. But this is not, these are not the terms. To find the actual terms, which are going to be numbers, I have to evaluate the derivatives. And what does evaluate mean? It means your final thing has to be a number. It means find the number. So I have to evaluate the derivatives with c equals 16, with c plugged in. So I do that here, and I get numbers. But that's not, I'm not done at that point either, because I have to put it in the actual formula for the Taylor term. Divide by n factorial, multiply by that, x minus c to the n. So I do that here. Right, whoops, there we go. Okay, and that gives me three terms, three non-zero terms, so that's what they wanted. So after the smoke clears, and you figured out the derivatives and plugged in the values for c so that you get coefficients and divide by n factorial and so forth, our three-term Taylor series for the square root of x centered about x equals 16 is this. And this would only be useful, you'd only use this for values of x that are near 16. Now in our specific example, we're going to evaluate the square root of 16.4, but this could be used to get an approximation for the square root of any number fairly close to 16. What's fairly close? Well, if we got up near to 25, we wouldn't want to use 16 as our c as our center anymore. We would use 25 because that's a perfect square. Or if we got down closer to 9, we would use 9 as our perfect square. So this is a good three-term approximation in the region of x equals 16. And I am still putting x in red because I want to point out something. This is the variable. This is a polynomial. Essentially, you could multiply it out. It's called a power uh, series. It's called a power series where you have constant term, a linear term, a square term, and so forth, like a polynomial. It's a polynomial series, often called a Taylor polynomial. Back to the point. My point is that there's only one variable in this, x, and it only occurs here within these parentheses. So if you construct your Taylor series and you see an x here, or you see an x here in the coefficient, you've done something wrong, and you need to go back and fix your understanding of it and calculate these so that they are numbers and so that x only occurs here like this. There should be no functions of x, no e to the x, no sine of x in your finished product. This is a polynomial, which means x is only going to occur in the parentheses minus this, this c, this center, and then that quantity will be li absent, linear, um, squared, cubed, and so forth. All right, in our specific example, we want to approximate the square root of 16.4, and I've left it in red to emphasize that we're going to plug this in for the red x here. And when you do that, 16.4 minus 16, you get this, 0.4. So what was here, you get uh, no 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to the 0, really, 0.4 to the 1, 0.4 squared, 0.4 cubed, and so forth down the line. And look what we've done. We've taken the square root function and reduced it to where all we have to do are the four basic operations of arithmetic. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And the uh, power of infinite series and the power of the Taylor series in particular is it takes any function you have, um, e to the x, sine of x, all of the natural log of x. All these functions would be very difficult to evaluate by hand or perhaps um, try to measure them out somehow using a rule. And it reduces them to just a polynomial and to calculate an approximation, you're using the four basic operations of arithmetic. So if I go through and I do this, and it would not be that hard to do it by hand, um, which is how they would have done it before calculators, and I get this. And the reason I've written out so many digits is I wanted to compare it to the TI-89, which takes a longer series and gets a more uh, precise value. And when I did that, I found that I'm only off by 0.0001%. So it's a tiny error using only three terms. And part of the reason the error is so small is that we're relatively close to the value of 16 here, 16.4. If we were further away, say 18 or 19 or 20, the error would be bigger, and to get, reduce the error, we would want to take more terms.